All right, Anthony, thanks for joining me on the Hall of Fame Fatherhood podcast. It's good to have you. Uh, I am joined today by Anthony Miglarino. Did I say that right? You did. You got it. Okay. Uh, Anthony is uh, the the coach and the man behind uh, PeacefulFathers.com and also Oak and Rock Fatherhood, which he started with uh, Zach Small, who was a previous guest of the podcast. And uh, so, Anthony, thanks for joining me today and look forward to diving into fatherhood and and all that. So, yes, sir. Welcome. Steve, thanks for having me on, brother. I appreciate it. Yeah. And um, as always, man, these are important conversations and I enjoy them. I really do from like deep within my soul. I love when I can get together with another father. We could sit down and we could talk about ways how we could be better. Absolutely. Absolutely. So why don't we just start off, you know, share a little bit about your journey. You know, when did you become a father? You know, what did all that look like and where are you at today? Yeah, definitely, man. It, it's been a, it's been a long journey. I can say yeah. that. And um, for the, for the people who say life is short, I don't buy into that. <laughs> it is, um, it is a, a a long, strenuous, difficult, and, and joyous path. So I am 44 now, and I became a father uh, one month after I turned 20. It's when I had my first daughter. And uh, three years later, I had my second daughter. And then five years later, I actually had my son, my first son, well, my only son. And uh, like, like most people, I was raised in a traditional style um, home, traditional parenting, and I guess being a father, you know, becoming a father at a, a young age, I, um, I saw the beauty in it or I saw the joy. I, I loved that I had these little people who depended on me. And it took a while, but I, I started to see how, mis how everybody typically mistreated their kids. And I just, mm -hmm. something within me was like, man, this is not right. There's something wrong. Why are so many parents yelling at their kids? Why do I see parents hitting their kids? Uh, you know, there, there was something missing. So from a young age, I vowed to not treat my kids that way. And I, I never, um, uh, well, I could say I never hit my daughters. I never spanked them. There were punishments, but it wasn't until my son was born where the, the light bulb really went off. And I, I, you know, I started thinking to myself, man, I, I need to do better. I need to figure out better ways. There has to be some resources. There needs to be something going on where I can show not only my daughters, but my son, what a good man looks like, right? How could I build up within myself to give my kids the best example? And those conversations were not having, you know, they weren't happening. They weren't dads. Every dad that I met, they were talking about football, what beer they drank, right. you know, sports teams. It was all surface level bullshit. And when I did start to speak about it people push back and, and you know even mm -hmm. family members everybody's like what are you talking about man you're a conspiracy theorist you're crazy mm -hmm. this what do you mean we need to treat kids like human beings so you know at that moment i knew um that it was the right thing to do right right <laughs> you know screw what everybody else thought um and then i just kept diving into peaceful parenting i started reading a lot of parenting books and um before long, I started to see the results of that, right? I started to see my kids were developing their own personality. They had high emotional intelligence. They were capable of doing things on their own. I didn't have to keep telling them, right? And that's a, a behavior that most parents get stuck in. They're always mm -hmm. fighting with their kids. They're always arguing. They're always demanding. And they just want their kids to listen, but they never think about, well, how do I really get my kid to listen? And for me, it was simple, right? It's, it's all about connection. It was all about okay. influence. If, if I could have my kids look up to me, admire me, then my influence will be effective. They would trust me. They would know that I always had the best intentions for them. And, and they knew that because I wasn't just saying it, but I was living it, right? I, I wasn't raising my voice. I wasn't hitting them. I wasn't punishing them. Um, I was actually guiding them to figure things out on their own. I was coaching them to become better. Uh, but to do that, I had to become better, right? I had to be that example. Right. Well, yeah, I, uh, 
so many so many different branches we can can go there uh like what do you think what was the the light bulb that went off between your second daughter and your son that was it a specific event was it what was that that flipped the switch for you so i would say that prior to my son being born um i worked a lot <clears throat> and it consumed my life right i spent a lot of time working i have my, i have i used to have my own business and <clears throat> i saw that my family wasn't as strong as i thought it should be meaning that um i i realized the light bulb was i realized that when i wasn't there and i wasn't as present as i should be my family suffered right my wife wasn't as happy my kids were displaying behaviors and traits that were a little bit chaotic mm -hmm. and that was to me that was a light bulb right it, it was it was making a stand saying I, I can't live like this right this isn't this isn't what a family should be right by no means the hard part was is like i said before you looked around and everybody was living that way right, right? everybody was mistreating their kids everybody was punishing their kids and nobody thought twice so i would say that when my son was born that was that was the point where i was more mature that i could understand my role as a father better before i was young and i just i knew i wanted to do right right i didn't want to harm my daughters i was the protector mm -hmm. the provider when my son was born um that was the moment i was like man i'm you know i'm a lot more mature now um and I need to start taking this role seriously. I, I really need to put in the work. Mm -hmm. And uh, that led me down a path of removing my, my OCD and my workaholism in my business to parenting, right? It, it's, like if, <laughs> it's like if you have this ailment, right? If, if people say, oh, I have ADHD or I have OCD, it's, it's like, all right, well, that's, that's a part of me, right? It's, it's in my personality. It's in my DNA. Mm -hmm. Instead of seeing it as a fault, I just transferred that energy to something that was more beneficial. Yeah, yeah. And uh, that led me, you know, that led me down a um, almost obsessive path to becoming a better dad. And, um, you know, that that's the thing. And it's something I teach my kids, right? You don't want to always point out your faults. You don't want to dwell on your faults, what you lack, what you're no good at. You want to use them as ammunition, right? You want to use them as power to fuel you yeah. to become better. And, um, you know, that's an important lesson. It, it's a lesson that I've seen played over and over again with my kids. You know, we, we hear they're saying you, you take one step back, two steps forward. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's that's true, man. It, it, it has to be the mindset that you uh, adopt in your home. It has to be the mindset that you adopt within yourself as a man. Be and not because it just benefits you, but because it becomes the, the family mantra. Right. If your kids right. see you fail or they see you make mistakes and you don't let that determine where you're going to go next that is like the, the most motivating thing you can do for your family for your wife for your kids even your friends right everybody reaps the benefit of that right there's really no downside the the problem um what i saw and you know just especially in culture and society is everybody resorted back to to traditional parenting and nobody was taking the steps to grow becoming a mother or a father, right? It was mothers to a degree get it, right? They're a little right. bit more compassionate. They're a little bit more understanding. Yeah. Um, or we have this perception that they are. So to go sidetrack a little, after I did research, I learned that mothers actually abuse their kids more than fathers do, right? They hit them more. That, yeah. Yep. Absolutely. But anyway, to, to get back to my point, <laughs> you know, this traditional parenting, what everybody thinks is the right way, it's almost like we're operating on autopilot, right? We're, mm -hmm. we're doing things over and over again, and it's not effective. It's not getting the results we want, right? It's, it's not getting our kids to listen. It's not getting our kids to understand how to solve problems, but we keep repeating the process. Right. So the moment I took myself out of that um, matrix or falsehood right out of that delusion of the life I was living. And I started applying real principles to my life. I started having a value system and saying, Hey, 
all right, I want to be a good man. What does that look like? What do I need to do? How do I have to treat myself? How do I have to treat my wife? How do I have to treat my kids? And I just started chipping away at it. And I just started living by those values. And I didn't break them for anybody. Right? I didn't, I didn't fold under pressure because my kid was crying and screaming. Instead of looking at the behavior and saying, oh, my God, this is such a bad kid. Or, you know, they're misbehaving. I said, wow, man, my kid is in, in pain. What can I do to help her? Mm. And, and that is the constant evolution. You know, that's just, I, and I feel bad for dads who can't feel that or go through that. Because to me, that is real power. That's, that's masculinity. To, to be able to say, I'm strong mm. enough to handle a, a temper tantrum from a five-year-old. <laughs> that's a, that's a, wow, like so many, again, so many branches that we can, can jump off, but it's, I mean, your statement of like, that's real masculinity. Like what comes to mind is traditionally, I guess you, you would say the traditional view would be like, you know, the exertion of will over your child to get them to quote unquote, listen, you know, that was viewed as masculinity, right? So now you're flipping that on its head and saying, no, your ability to stay calm and grounded and not lose your shit because your five-year-old is crying because he does, because that's what five-year-olds do. Like that's real masculinity. And that's, I agree a hundred percent. Yeah. I mean, but listen, it, it could be open for debate, right? That there could be right. guys who say, no, that's not masculine. That's giving in. That's giving your kids control of your home or that, that's being weak. It's being passive, but that's not what I do. Right. I, I don't let my kids run the home. Um, what I do is like you said, Steve, you know, we, if we want to get a clear picture of what masculinity is, fatherhood is the most masculine thing you can do it, it's literally why we're here is to have kids and create right right it, w- without that <clears throat> i mean i guess you can you you can be a man but to to harness that power is the ultimate masculinity trip agreed <laughs> yeah yeah and uh you know like when i heard like peaceful parenting um Like one thought that I've had is like, because it kind of sounds like, say, sounds weak, or in kind of like <laughs> new age type, yeah, you know, woke. <laughs> yeah, and it's like, well, we have millennia of quote unquote traditional parenting, and you know, results are debatable on how successful it's been, but it's it's built you know, it's built the generations before us to both good and bad. So it's like, well, I mean, honestly, if you, if you look at history, it's been pretty dark, man. (laughs) Well, yeah, I mean, it it definitely has its ills for sure. And it's like, well, but it also got, got us to this point. And I think it feels like a, a collective like death like with everything that's going on in the world like shit is changing you know no matter what you think about it things aren't going back to 2019 or before like and i think adopting this new way you know adopting a new way of parenting or a new perspective it kind of feels like yeah you have to step out of your comfort zone to be able to stay grounded when your kid is crying and like that's not easy to do no it's not and i don't think it's a relatively new way um i think that if if you go back historically um you know there have been there's evidence showing that um in even in like primitive tribes right that the mother would have the baby attached to them the whole time they're in childhood the father would take them out to gather, to hunt. Like they were, they were the, the, the civilizations that thrived were the ones where the families were connected. 
And I think what we we've gotten away from that, um, and you can say it's probably because of you know the modernization technology, right? It, life has become easier. Mm-hmm. You know, a lot of people put their kids in daycare. A lot of people get nannies, and a lot of people don't even raise their kids anymore, yeah. right? Whether it's a, a neglectful abandonment or just somebody else raising them. So kids are no longer connected to their mm-hmm. parents. Mm-hmm. And I think that's the effects we're seeing, right? If, if we could, if we could think about relationships, you need connection, you need to be connected to people mm-hmm. to survive. Right. right? And if, if you don't get that in childhood, your perception of reality is going to be distorted, right? There's going to be trauma, there's going to be pain, that is going to dictate the way your life goes, instead of you actively pursuing it. And I think that's a lot of what I see. And so getting back to the masculinity thing, you know, as men, we know that the, the, the short way is not the answer, right? We know that any, anything that's quick and easy to get short-term results is going to be ineffective, right? right? It's like 99% of the time, right? We want to focus on long-term goals. So when I tell, you know, I tell dads, listen, stop spanking your kid. That's an easy, quick fix. And it doesn't really fix it. It just puts the child in fear and, and obedience in that moment. Let's mm-hmm. think long-term, right? What would a man, how, how would a man solve a problem? The quick and easy fix, if that's who you want to be, then continue probably damaging your child's developing brain. But if you want long-term results, let's start focusing on, on how that looks, right? Let's, let's start having conversations about um, how we're going to develop our child into a healthy adult and what we need to do that. So I think those are the, the conversations that we need to have as men, right? What is a healthy attachment? What does a good relationship look like? Um, you know, one key principle that I go off of is the non-aggression principle. Right? You, you don't that? use, you don't inflict aggression on another individual, right? The only time you can is when it's in self-defense. Okay. And if we hold to that principle, that means that we can't use aggression on our kids. Right. And, and the principle is, uh, it's universal, right? We, we know that it's, it's true. I'm going to put that in quotes. Mm-hmm. But I don't want anybody using ag- aggression against me, right? I don't want anybody to, to take my money through taxation. I don't want anybody to violate my, um, you know, my body and, and rape me. I don't want anybody to steal my property. I don't want anybody to scream and yell at me and threaten me with violence, right? Those are standards I have in my life and I know I don't want them. So why would I ever treat my kid that way? Why would I ever aggress against my kid, right? Especially since I'm 185 pound grown man. And if you have kids who are young, say five-year-old or a four-year-old, they're, they're a quarter of your size, Right. We shouldn't right. be, if we're going to use aggression, use it in self-defense, use, use it against somebody your size who's aggressing against you. Don't use that power. Don't abuse that power over your kids. So to, yeah. again, it, that's to me, that's being masculine, right? It, it, the people who are dependent on us for survival, for safety, for their life, let's not break that principle. Let's teach our kids that we're the protector, right? We're never going to harm right. them. We're not going to harm them physically. We're not going to harm them emotionally. And, you know, and, and then that's the other part of it is the manipulation, right? I don't want people manipulating me in my life. I don't want people trying to bribe me to do things that I don't want to do. The people that care yeah. about me, who I choose to have in my life, I want them to be solid, right? I want them to, right. to speak their mind, to be impeccable with their word. To, to not make assumptions, right? These, these are the four agreements. <laughs> yeah, yep. Uh, but <clears throat> those are the type of people I want in my life. And as a man, if you start bringing those people into your circle and you have that high standard, right? You continue to raise the bar and you say, I don't want scumbags in my life. I don't want people who are going to ma- manipulate me. I don't want narcissists. I don't want abusers. You know, I don't want uh, this, this macho fucking dude who thinks he's tough always trying to test me so he can feel good i I genuinely want good people in my life who are motivating me pushing me i need to show my kids what that looks like Mm. right and and not just in the life i live but 
absolutely how I treat them, right? I want them to, to see their father and not see him as a superhero, which would be cool, but to see him as a human being who is going through the process of becoming better continually, nonstop, never giving up, always looking to improve, always looking to expand his horizons. Mm. And when he, when he does mess up, he's man enough to, to admit it. He's man enough to apologize. Yeah. What, what's the, I, you, you coach men and parents in this, what's the biggest challenge that you face? What do you mean? Like a specific or like, what's the biggest pushback that someone gives you? Well, I mean, specific, there's a, there's a whole bunch of different tasks that uh, most parents struggle with, but I would say that the biggest pushback to men is the fear of making their kids weak. So that's why they apply a pressure, right? It's Mm -hmm. like, if your kid, let's say you have a son and you look at him, you're like, oh man, he's weak, right? He's not doing masculine things. So the dad, instead of building a relationship where you try to find out what it is your kid loves to do, you push things on him that you think are going to make him better. And if you examine that, right, that's just your own insecurities, Mm -hmm. right? Because if, if we're going to say being a dad is this, you know, superpower, we, we, we can do great things as men, then you see your child as weak you can't help but think that has something to do with you. Right. Right. So it, it, I see that element in a lot of fathers. And again, you know, when, when you parent with principles, you, you have to examine things like that. You have to see your kid for who he is, right? He might be stuck somewhere. He might be a 10 year old who doesn't feel good about himself, who has low self-esteem and he doesn't need you to redirect them to what's going to, what you think is going to make him better. He needs you to build him up from within, right? He, he, mm. needs, he needs you to accept who he is so you can help build that, that character, right? That personality right. within him. And unfortunately, we, we miss that a lot because we let our own fears take over. And, and that's where you see dads who are very controlling, dads who are um, authoritative, mm. right? Authoritarian, they, they'll constantly... Um, They'll constantly operate out of fear where they're just uh, being dominating over their kid. They're not letting their kid express themselves. They don't let their kids back talk. Right. I, I tell people, I tell, <laughs> I tell people I, I let my kids express themselves freely. They don't have to hold any punches back with me. If my child back talks to me ever, and they have, I don't let it harm me. I don't let it deflate my ego. Right. I know that right. it's something they're going through. So what is, what does that look like? Like when your kid is essentially unloaded on you, like, what does that look like? Like if you can draw a picture for us as an example of maybe some words or questions or, you know, how you would deal with that situation just as an example. Yeah, no, definitely. So you know, one thing that gets tricky is when kids become teenagers and you talk about curfew. Mm. And a lot of parents think that if they set a curfew, their kid has to obey it, right? And, and that curfew is set by the parent. So it, it becomes the parent wins, the kid loses. The kid has no feedback. They have no say. And we miss this mark as a parent, as a, especially as a father, because the father is usually the one setting the curfew. So instead of getting input from your kid, right, instead of saying, hey, you know, I would love if you can come home at 10 o'clock and they were like, oh, but dad, everybody else gets to stay out to 11, 10 o'clock. I don't care. What does that do? Right. That that leaves one party in that relationship not being seen and not being heard. Right. We are telling that kid, listen, I as a dad, I feel that 10 o'clock is the right time and my feelings are very important. I don't care what you're going through. I don't care what you think. I don't care what you feel about this. I'm putting my foot down. And that's going to get, oh, you know what, dad, screw you. Or, you know, that, that's going to get the pushback. Right. Because if in any other relationship, if you treated somebody like that, 
you would get the same pushback. Right. Right. If, if you tried to control another human being, they're going to push back. So to solve the problem, right, and, and try to think more clearly, be, be more open about what's going on, because ultimately you want you, you the, the ultimate goal is you just want your kid to come home safe. Right. right. You, you just want him to, to come home, be able to go in his bed and wake up the next morning. And I and I get it. Right. It's stressful. Um, what I started doing in my home is I learned how to negotiate with my kids. Right. I learned how to give them some power in a situation. Mm. So if I wanted them home at 10 and they were like, oh, dad, all the other kids stay out to 11. I would say, meet me halfway. Let's go 1030. I don't care about that half hour. All I care about is my kid coming home safe. And you know what? Now they see the relationship and they say, hey, I did have some say, right? Dad thinks I am important. Dad, mm. dad thinks I'm responsible. And that's how you build that confidence. And it's not a like, you know, this isn't snap your fingers and it happens. Right. You might, you might agree at 1030. He might come home at 1045. Right? So, right. so now you have a conflict. Now he comes home and you're like, we agreed at 1030. Um, unfortunately, what I say to that is they're kids. What do they really have? Like they, they understand time. But when you're a kid and you were, you were younger, I was yep. well, a long time ago, I was a teenager. <laughs> when you're in the heat of the moment, man, you're not always actively thinking about, oh, my, man, I'm going to be late. I'm, like I know most adults can't even show up on time. Mm -hmm. right. Right? It's, it's a difficult task. So what I would do is I would say, okay, it's cool, 1045, I'll see you in the morning. In the morning time, we sit down and be like, hey, listen, you were a little late last night. You think next time you can, you know, we can try to meet that mark, what we agreed to. Yeah, right. dad, okay. Right. And you just keep going through that process. Um, and, and why it's so beneficial is when, when we set curfews, we think that our kids are gonna be in danger because they're hanging out with other kids. Right. So the peaceful parenting philosophy is when your kids are younger and they depend on you, right? When they have a healthy dependence with their dad, when dad treats them kind, when dad shows them respect, when dad doesn't um, hit or abuse them physically or mentally, mm -hmm. you build a connection and you create a, a, a real healthy attachment. So now your kid knows what a healthy relationship looks like. So when he goes out, when he becomes a teenager now, and he's like, oh, I'm, I'm independent. I don't need you anymore, dad. And you're yeah. like, okay. And this is how I am with my kids. When my kids go out, they don't need me. I've, I've done my job, right? I, I've made sure that I, I cultivated um, a little bit of intrinsic value within my kids. Mm -hmm. So now they go out and their friends are like, oh, let's, you know, let's go get drunk or let's go sniff glue in the back parking lot. Right. I don't know what kids do these days. Yeah, I don't know either, but <laughs> but so I know that my kids, um, I shouldn't say always, but a large percentage of the time, they're gonna make the right decision. Or they might make a mistake, and that's fine. When they do, we talk about it. Mm -hmm. But I always had that that um, instinct <clears throat> that I was doing my job well, so I didn't need to worry. And I think that's what we miss a lot as parents. The worry and the fear comes. Because deep down, we know we're not living or we're not parenting with a high standard. We haven't built that relationship prior. So now our kid's going to go out. And of course, all these other kids from broken homes, from dysfunctional homes, they're going to influence our kids more than we can. Right. When, like when you say that, because if, if you're the author, authoritarian parent that's like set the rules, it would no regard to the child but then they're hanging out with you know the kids who don't have the rules they're obviously going to go with the follow the kids because that's the easier path and there's not that intrinsic you know uh, understanding of what's right and wrong and you know yeah make that choice independently 100 percent, man they're not going to have that internal compass, right? That internal morality. Yeah. Telling them what's good or what's not good, what's right or wrong. And that's what so many young people struggle with nowadays, mm -hmm. right? They, they can't determine what's good for them or what's bad for them. And, and that's part of that, 
you know, being a child. Right. But um, the, the other part of that is if, if we are continually, uh, again, abusing our kids physically, emotionally, mentally, they're not going to know what, uh, what that good relationship is supposed to look and feel like. So now they're, they're in the back of their mind. They're always going to be saying to themselves, I have to change who I am so my dad will love me. Because if I show him who I really am, he gets mad. He punishes me. Right? If, if, I, if I actually take a stand and I say, hey, dad, I disagree. Or, hey, dad, I would really like to do this. Mm-hmm. Right? Or, hey, dad, no. <laughs> right. So what, what that child will do is he'll, he'll change who he is. He'll actually erase his personality mm-hmm. to fit what the dad wants him to see. So now when that kid goes out with his friends, he's going to show those friends exactly what they want to see. Mm-hmm. So he can be accepted. And right. man, I don't need to tell you how destructive that could be. No, I, I understand. I've seen no from personal experience what that is like. And yeah. uh, it doesn't, it's a, it's a long road to understanding where all that action is coming from and all those decisions are coming from uh, when you're in those shoes. And it's, you know, the, and just thinking about your example of communicating about curfew, like just think about the skills that you're teaching your kids, you know, to negotiate, you know, to go back and forth with their boss. If they can go back and forth with their dad, they sure as hell can go back and forth with their boss. With the woman. Right. And it's it's like, real life skills. Right, exactly. And it's like, yeah. I, I have a six-year-old son and he was struggling. He bought, he's sick, so he struggles with taking a bath. And Like every six-year-old. Yeah, every day. <laughs> right, it's time to take a bath. No, 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 wine, wine, wine. And today, it was like, I had the patience, the work, the awareness, and all that, the mindset. And it was like, you know, you're whining. Are you going to get the result, or is there a better way that you can tell me that you don't want to take a bath? Because essentially, that's what you're telling me, right? And he's like, yeah. And I told him a couple of days prior, like, when you don't want to take a bath, you tell me, Dad, can I have three more minutes? And then I will go take a bath. So then he takes ownership. Like, he knows that's the right thing to do. And, but he's communicating to me, I just need three more minutes, I don't know, to wrap my head around (laughs) that I have to take a bath. And then he does it. And he don't fuss. There's no argument. I don't get to yelling or anything like that. And it was great. I mean, there's really no other way to put it. Uh, It was fun. Yeah, exactly. And, And that's, you know, to a degree, that's what we should be doing. We should be making things that are difficult or things that gave us difficulty. We should be figuring out how to make them fun and enjoyable. Who wants to every night for 18, well, let's say for 10 years, right? Because hopefully after 10, your kid can take a bath on his right. own or a shower. But every day for 10 years, who wants to have that fight over and over again? And not only just a fight, but if, if dads aren't handling it the way that you just described, what does that do? It, it builds up resentment, right? It, it builds up anger in the kid. And, and now not only does the bath become not fun but now there's punishments involved right if you don't take a bath i'm going to take away your toys i'm mm-hmm. going to take away your vid- so you're really holding them hostage right you're treating them like a prisoner if you don't right. do what i say right there's going to be some negative consequences right who 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 would want to be in that relationship who would enjoy it you know and we think no, it's but, not important but it is and like our son he goes to a montessori school and so he is self-guided throughout the day. It's, you know, he don't ever have a teacher telling him, you got to do X, Y, and Z. And there's times where he's home and we're like, hey, it's time to do X, Y, and Z. And he rebels. 
And so I asked them, you know, do you just not like being told what to do? Like, it's a change, you know, sometimes because it just doesn't happen in school. He's like, no, I don't like, you know, he don't like being told what to do. And I get that because I was the same way and still much the same way. I hate being told what to do. And it's like, okay, so now I can understand. Now I just have to change my approach. It's not about the bath or brushing the teeth or whatever the task is. It's just, there's a different way to get him there to do the right thing. And that's the key. Right, that's the key is because when we stop focusing on the child and we start looking at ourselves, right? that's self-ownership. That's like, that's saying, hey, I'm a father and I'm going to take this job seriously. I'm going to be responsible. I'm not going to abuse my power and I'm going to help guide my son to what needs to get done without violence, without manipulation. Mm-hmm. I'm going to actually carry him when he can't do it. You know, not literally. Right, right. Well, and like going back to your curfew example, like if he shows up late, like you still address it, but you're not coming down with a hammer. But it's like, it made me think like, you know, if, unless you as the parent are on time, a hundred percent to every appointment that you ever have in life, then maybe you can say something. But just because you're the parent, like you're still setting the example. And if you're you're setting the example of, hey, yeah, I show up to late sometimes to work or to wherever. Well, there's your example. You know, it's like you yeah. have to always point. No, no that's back. a new, good point. I, I really haven't thought of that angle too much. Right. Don't be a hypocrite. Right. <laughs> but. I would say that the most important thing is what you're building in those moments is trust. Mm -hmm. You're, you're giving your kid signs that you trust him. Right. And when you punish, you show him that you don't trust him, that he's a bad kid, that he's incapable of following rules. And this is something that we get, we get completely screwed up with as fathers because you want that trust, right? You, and you have to earn it as a parent. You don't just get it because you're the dad. Mm-hmm. And it, where it comes in to be a really big deal is when your son is an hour late and something bad is going on, right? Or he got, he got beat up or he got in a fight or other kids are using drugs mm-hmm. or they want to go rob a liquor store, whatever, right? I don't right. know what kids do these days. <laughs> no, but seriously, like if something bad is about to pop off, you want your son to call you up and say, hey, dad, I'm in a really bad spot, man. I need you to not be mad. I need help. Mm-hmm. That, those are like life-saving moments. And, and that's why you want connection, right? That's why you want to negotiate with your kid. That's why you, you want to give him some power in the decision he makes in his own life. And, and that starts little, yeah. right? You said you have a six-year-old. The, the curfew example was obviously the, the more stressful teenage years. Mm-hmm. But that goes with the six-year-old cleaning his room, right? Let him pick the time he wants to clean it. Make sure that you're helping him clean it, showing him what it looks like to be organized. When you go and do it with him, make it fun, right? Make it like an activity you guys can do together. It doesn't have to be this task that he's going to hate every time, right? Show him that it's, it's great to do things. Mm-hmm. It's great to be, you know, have your room clean and, and have mental clarity. Yeah. I, I, there's so many people who, who struggle with that as adults. Mm-hmm. They go to somebody's house and you're like, oh, man. You know, I get anxiety sometimes. Well, I shouldn't even say my house is a disaster. <laughs> I got three kids, a wife, four dogs, 12 chickens, two cats. It's, I shouldn't even talk. But, you know, that it, that's where it starts, right? You build that relationship when they're young. It's, it's about prevention, right? So when you focus on prevention, that's much greater than reacting in those moments, Right. right. So when your kid doesn't want to clean his room, you're going to lash out and scream at him and tell him that he's stupid and he's lazy and you're going to take his tablet away and he can't have ice cream for a week. What, what's the goal? Like, what are we trying to do? Are we, are we trying to teach our kid how to get the test done? Or are we trying to make them feel bad for existing? Right. To me, it's, it's a clear choice, obviously. Yeah. Um, 
So when you do go through those, since we're using that example, Steve, I'll just, I'll break down like some basic things, right? If, if you tell your kid to clean his room and he's like, ah, no, I don't want to do it. Decode the behavior, see what's going on. Like, like you said, you, you sat and talked to your kid, mm -hmm. listen, see, you know, maybe there's something really cool somewhere else going on and he doesn't want to give his attention at that moment because you said so. Right. Right. And, and then and that's fine. Right. When the, again, dads will say, Oh, you can't let him control everything. Mm -hmm. No, you say, Hey, listen, bud, we got to clean our room. I, I see you, you got something to do right now. That's cool, man. You're playing a video game. All right. Can I play with you? Right. Get into his world a little bit, see what he's doing, have mm -hmm. fun in that moment, play a video game for 15 minutes and say, all right, Hey, you want me to help you clean your room? There's so many ways that we can go about raising our kids. Mm -hmm. Well, we, we let our frustration, we, we let, really, we, we let our weak-minded minds, right? That weak-minded part of our brain control the interaction. And that's yeah. why we always fail. Yeah, I mean, it can definitely, it's definitely easier said than done. Uh, but it's oh, yeah. definitely a worthwhile task. Um, what... So let's switch gears just a little bit. How was it when you began your journey to peaceful parenting? How was it with the relationship with your wife? And <laughs> yeah, how did that transition go? Was that's she like, a, what the hell are you up to? Like this that's a like great that. question, brother. Uh, my wife hated me. <laughs> <laughs> she did, man. I, I heard, you know, because here's the dynamic. I'm learning all these better ways on how to be a better dad. And I'm trying to share it with her. And she was still stuck in her old ways. Yeah. So of course there's going to be resistance. Right. And then I'm like, Hey babe, look at this. You know, you don't do it like this. And she's like, you know, keep putting me down more. Thank you. Right. right. Tell me how bad of a mom I am. Yeah. So it, it actually, and, and I think this is with any, area of your life that you grow and you get better with right you it's exciting it's new right you go all in and, and you're like oh let's go let's you know storm the gates and let's raise the best kids we can mm -hmm. but you have to remember that you have to take your family with you and that includes your wife mm -hmm. so it, it really you know it, it i think it was probably after the probably 500th time that i heard my wife say you don't know you don't owe um you don't know everything <laughs> <laughs> right, maybe 500, maybe a thousand times I heard that. I had to take a step back and I had to say, man, I need to listen to her, right? I need to understand what she's going through. And then I needed to help her, right? I had to be a coach for her, be a leader for her and say, hey, listen, you don't, you know, you don't have to have that argument anymore with the kids. I'm going to show you a way we could work around it, right? I'm going to help you. I'm going to provide for you. And that was not easy as well, right? That took a lot of time, it took a lot of patience on my end. It, it took me uh, a long time to figure out that I was capable of helping my wife in these situations without hurting her, right? Without making her feel bad. And in turn, that made me a better man, right? It made me a better coach. So it, it's definitely, you know, it's definitely a process that you're going to have to go through, right? And, and I think you have to face it, right? You can't hide from it. Right. You can't be like, I'm going to be the greatest dad in the world. And my wife just doesn't get it. She's a loser. What, how is that going to look in the marriage? Right. right. Not it's good. Good. <laughs> no, it's going to be Not shitty. Good. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, brother. It's, it's all about building strong families, right? It, there's so many dots to connect once you can put on a different lens, right? Once you can get all that bullshit out of your mind and, and start really focusing on what it is you want. And yeah. to me, that's a life philosophy, right? It, it's no matter where you're at in life, just understanding that you control your life, right? Focus on the things you can control. Mm -hmm. Don't focus on the distractions. And there's many of them. Oh, so many. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. And, but it's true. Don't, don't you, don't waste your energy on that garbage. Mm -hmm. What you can control in your home Right. You could control how you treat your kids. You can't right. control how your kids behave. Right. Yeah. But you can control how you treat them. You can control how much love you give them. 
which is should always be infinite, right? Unconditional love. You can control if you're going to raise your hand and hit them because they didn't eat their dinner, right? Those are things we need to stop. We need to really take a look at ourselves in the mirror and say, is this what a good man does? Mm. I don't, I don't want to be like that and make the choice to change. Damn. Well, honestly, I don't think there can be a better message to, I think that's a great place to stop. Uh, yeah, man. <laughs> great message. Great question to, to ask of yourself. If you're listening, um, yeah so what tell us what are you up to where should we check you out yeah man so you can find me on all social media at peaceful fathers on twitter and instagram and my website is peacefulfathers.com that's where i offer one-on-one -on -one coaching uh, I, I write my blog a lot of it is on uh Parenting, obviously, peaceful parenting, psychology, and um, we've—I mean, we're, I'm doing a lot. So, you know, with Zach, uh, Zach Small, me and him, we run Oak and Rock Fatherhood. We have a YouTube channel. Mm -hmm. We're going to be having a website soon, podcast. Um, we're going to be adding a lot of things to that, and uh, we run Dad's Day on Twitter, uh, Monday to Friday. Uh, you know, Zach and I, we run that. That's an open discussion. It's a fatherhood discussion, mostly. And we, we encourage people to come on and, you know, speak their truth, tell their story. And it's, it's actually been having really great feedback. So I'm enjoying it. That's awesome. Yeah, man. Well, Anthony, I uh, thank you for joining me. Enjoyed the conversation and the message. And uh, hopefully we can do a round two. Yes, sir. Thanks for having me on, brother. Appreciate it. All right, brother. Talk to you soon.